Good afternoon, Chamber members. For those of you I haven't met yet, I'm Sabrina Binkley, Head of School at Spruce Tree Montessori and Chair of the Fairbanks Chamber Board of Directors. And I'm coming to you from outside today, trying to enjoy a little bit of sunshine. I'd like to take a moment to thank our executive partners whose logos you saw on the screen before we began today. These members are the backbone of the Fairbanks Chamber's advocacy efforts. And more than ever, the Fairbanks Chamber is appreciative of their partnership. A full list of our executive partners can be found on our website. I'd like to now welcome Brenna to help us recognize our new and renewing members. Brenna? Thank you, Sabrina. We'd like to thank our renewing executive partner, TDL Staffing. We appreciate your continued support. And we would also like to thank our renewing members, North Haven Communities at Fort Wainwright, Crescent Electric Supply Company, Hunter UAS, River, Rivers Wood Products, City of North Pole, Green Star, Dateline Digital Printing, the Jeff Walsh Company, and Fairbanks Montessori School. We'd also like to thank our 110% club that have contributed above their membership investment. Samson Hardware True Value, Water Wagon, North Pole Coffee Roasting Company, Horizon Services, Golden Heart Parking Services, Anderson Group, Fairbanks Orthodontal Group, and Midnight Sun LLC. We're very appreciative of all of your support and it's always great to be able to read off so many new members and members that have renewed their membership. Also, today's membership minute centers around business response. So customers and community members are assessing how businesses handle reopening and the steps that they have currently taken. This in turn will influence where they spend their dollars. So we encourage you to publicize your efforts and your plans going forward to show the steps you are taking to safely reopen your business. Thanks, Sabrina, back to you. Great, Brenna, thank you so much. The Fairbanks Chamber Board of Directors met yesterday and approved a resolution to support resources development in our state. You may remember that we started talking about this effort back in February when we returned from our Juno fly-in. While in Juno, the governor pitched the idea of developing a resolution that could be used to demonstrate the support of Alaskans to responsibly develop the many resources in Alaska and create economic stability for our state and jobs for Alaskans. The resolution supports the development and balanced management of Alaska's natural resources, including energy, minerals, forestry, fisheries, wildlife, and agriculture, while protecting Alaska for future generations. The full text of the resolution can now be found on the Fairbanks Chamber website in the Adv Advocacy Actions section. This morning, our Government Relations Committee had a meeting with the Interior Delegation and then heard from Ben Stevens, the Governor's Chief of Staff. Most of these conversations revolved around the CARES Act community distributions, how much the communities within the borough would be eligible to receive, what costs could be paid using those funds, and the challenges presented with accepting and spending the money in a way that does not abrogate the state to pay back those funds in the future. There was also heavy discussion of what costs have been borne by our community-owned hospital and that were borne by the government entities in other parts of our state to cover those costs. We'll be tracking these issues closely and report to our membership on actions we take on these topics in the coming weeks. This week's reflective prompt stems from a conversation my husband and I had with our children this weekend about the uncertainties of, of the upcoming weeks, months, and year ahead. While we all agree that there are many unknowns right now, we decided that we have lots to look forward to. We challenged one another to think this week about where we'd like to be in five years and in 10 years. So for my 10 year old, this was really exciting. Mom, will I have a car? Will I be in college? And for our 14 year old, he wonders if he'd be in the NHL by then. So I challenge you this week, talk with your workplace teams and your family about what you can do today that will get you where you want to be in five and 10 years time. Remain optimistic that tomorrow is always a new day and that you'll get there together. Okay, Marissa, you're up for our president and CEO report. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, I have quite a few announcements today. I'm going to talk through a couple of events that we have coming up and then also uh, talking about some information that we're uh, hoping is helpful for our businesses here in Fairbanks. Uh, so first, our team is working on bringing our members some fun new virtual events that we'd love to see your faces online at. Uh, first, uh, just we had our first coffee talk last Wednesday. It was a huge success. Uh, we had representation from a wide range of our membership, from military to banking, UAS, and healthcare. Uh, we're happy to announce that this will become a weekly event starting next Wednesday on the 6th at 10 a.m. 
Uh, so make sure that you pay attention to uh, your uh, scoop and our calendar of events uh, for links and participation information there. You can also email Katie at katie at fairbankschamber.org. Uh, this week, we'll be hosting our first happy hour for some laid back fun. Uh, you can join us this Thursday, April 30th at 5.30 p.m. We're going to be playing bingo, so make sure you get your comfy clothes on, grab a beverage of your choice, and come and uh, participate in fun and the opportunity to win prizes. The winners will receive one of two gift cards. We've got one from Beaver Sports and one from Lavelle's Tap House, two of our favorite members. Uh, so make sure that you uh, join up with us and, and join in on the fun there. You can get registered uh, to receive an invitation link that will also get you two bingo cards for the game and also instructions that will come from Katie. So if you have registered and you haven't received that yet, just make sure that you pay attention to your email. You should have those this afternoon. Any questions, again, contact Katie at Katie dot, at, no, 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 sorry, Katie at fairbankschamber.org. Um, for membership orientation, it's been a while since we've done one of those as we've all been hunkered down, uh, but Brenna will be bringing you a membership orientation uh, virtually for our new members, as well as anyone that would like a refresher on all of the benefits that are provided to you through your membership of the Fairbanks Chamber. So this one uh, upcoming will take place on Thursday, May 7th at 1 p.m. Again, you can register on our website and Brenna will make sure that you get the contact information and the invitation link to participate virtually. Her email address is Brenna at fairbankschamber.org. And final event, you've noticed that as more and more snow melts, the trash uh, definitely did pile up over the winter. So we will be, our community will be doing cleanup day this year. Uh, registration is up and available on our website. It's also can be found at the Boy Scouts website. And there is a Facebook event and page, uh, both for this event. The yellow bags will be available at Green Star, at the Boy Scouts office, Cowles Heating, UAF's Constitution Hall and any local fire station or fire department. Um, this year, just in a response to some of the requests from our healthcare community and an effort to be socially responsible, we are asking people make sure uh, that you are uh, socially distant uh, or physically distant from uh, your party that you're cleaning up trash with. This is one of those events that is naturally conducive to being at least six feet apart from one another. Um, and then the other change for this year, rather than celebrating this on one day, uh, we're encouraging folks to do this over the course of a week. Uh, so Saturday, May 2nd through Saturday, May 9th is when we are calling uh, cleanup day this year. Uh, so please make sure that you see safety details on the, on the events page. Uh, make sure you wear your face mask, uh, wear gloves, mostly to protect your hands during the trash pickup effort, um, and also maintain a distance of six feet from any member of your group, especially if they're not members of your household. Um, so make sure that uh, you get out, clean up our city. I know this is a, a, a much look forward, a looked forward to event that we have hold every year, and we're happy to be able to continue that one this year. If you do have any questions, again, go to our website or you can email Katie. Um, so those are all some of our events that are coming up. Uh, as far as information, I know I've been fielding a lot of phone calls from businesses over the last several weeks asking questions about um, funding and other programs that are available for businesses. So I just wanted to encourage you, if you didn't apply for or receive Paycheck Protection Funding Program or funding through the Idle Loan Funding Program, you are encouraged to go back to either your lender for PPP or to the SBA website for Idle Loans uh, and apply now that those programs have received additional funding. Uh, there was also some new guidance that was released by the Department of Treasury yesterday on the criteria of seasonal employers related to the loan amount that they're eligible for through PPP. Uh, quick links for that information can be found on our COVID section of our website. And also finally, for businesses that have or are looking to reopen in a limited capacity in accordance with the easing of some of, of the mandates last week, uh, you're encouraged to visit the COVID section of our website. You can find some resources that will help your business develop a mitigation plan. And there's also some signage templates that you can use in your establishment to encourage hand, hand hygiene of your staff and your customers. Uh, you can also find that business toolkit that was developed and released last week by Foundation Health Partners. Again, all of this information and links and registration information can all be found on our website at fairbankschamber.org.
Thank you so much and back to you, Sabrina. Great, thanks, Marissa. Lots to look forward to. Now for our main presentation. So if you're watching this presentation live, please type your questions into the chat section and we will share them with our presenter at the appropriate time. The Fairbanks Chamber has always recognized the importance of education for the success of not only our business community, but our local economy as well. Now more than ever, we appreciate all the hard work our teachers are doing to help our children grow and learn. Today we will hear how UAF is educating our future educators and how they are adapting to the ever-changing needs of their students and Alaska's future. Amy Vinlove is the director of the UAF School of Education and an associate professor of education at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She has worked with the teacher preparation programs at UAF since 1999. Amy is a lifelong Alaskan with eight years of K-12 public school teaching experience, and she has been a national board certified teacher since 2000. Her research focuses on preparing new teachers to work with diverse populations and how to learn with and from their local communities, as well as on the recruitment, preparation, and support of Indigenous teachers for Alaska schools. She received a BA in Education Studies and Public Policy from Brown University, an MA in Curriculum and Instruction from the University of Colorado, and a PhD in Education Policy and Reform through the UAF Interdisciplinary PhD Program in 2012. Welcome, Amy. I'm so glad you could join us today. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to speak to you. Um, all right. So I have a presentation and some slides, and, I, and I'm looking forward to telling you a little bit about uh, some, some exciting and uh, new things that are going on at the UAF School of Education to prepare teachers for Alaska's future. Uh, so if you could go on to the next slide, um, I have kind of two areas of focus that I'm going to um, be focusing in on today. One is just looking at the actual content of our teacher preparation and a move that we currently have underway towards a more practice based teacher preparation program. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And then I'll also give you some information on some initiatives that we are ramping up in relation to the preparation and retention of Indigenous teachers in our programs and in Alaska schools. And in between there, I'll kind of sandwich in some information about uh, what's what's happened at the School of Education this spring and what we're looking towards um, for the fall in relation to the, the global situation that we're working under right now. So with that, I'm going to jump into some information about the, the, the format and sort of some changes in teacher preparation that have gone on um, and are currently underway at the School of Education. So if you could go to the next slide. I think that um, everybody sort of is pretty aware of the fact that schooling as a whole uh, has been changing and evolving over the, the last, um, you know, I could say decade. I mean, it always evolves, but I think we're seeing some really significant changes in schools these days, um, looking at our sort of our traditional model of schooling that a lot of us still grew up with, um, where we were all, um, you know, sitting at desks and the teacher would tell us what to do and we would turn to uh, the same page at the same time in our social studies textbook. and. Nowadays, we're seeing a lot more of this more uh, student-driven form of, of education, a more personalized form of education, um, where teachers are a little bit more of a facilitator and students are being offered more opportunities to work at their own levels and at their own paces. You're seeing more alternative furniture in classroom, not so much the desks, and seeing a lot more technology integration in the classroom. And then, of course, there's right now where we are, where we're doing everything through through this, through, <laughs> through Zoom video conferencing and trying to muddle our way through through that um, abrupt change that we suffered through. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, I think that in addition to just the actual way that that schools are looking these days and the ways that we're teaching, we're also seeing a uh, an adaptation of curriculum and what's being taught in schools from this sort of traditional notion of a fixed body of knowledge where everybody, um, you know, learns just math and, and reading and writing and arithmetic and, and all of that at, at school to a recognition, particularly from the external community um, and from a lot of uh, businesses and, and nonprofit partners that there are 
other types of, of uh, skills that kids need to have in order to enter the workforce. And oftentimes these are called 21st century workforce skills. There are things like collaboration and understanding how to think creatively, how to apply critical thinking processes, and how to communicate effectively with each other. So we're seeing this real shift in, in both how we're teaching and also the focus of the curriculum or an expansion on the focus of the curriculum. To the next slide, please. So in relation to this, teacher education has to change too. So what we do to prepare the teachers to teach in these new formats and with this new expansion of how they're teaching, we need to move from just presenting information about, for example, how to teach math methods, which of course is still a critical component of our teacher preparation program. But also we need to be teaching teachers these, these ways to facilitate learning that that promote these 21st century workforce skills. So we're shifting what we're doing in teacher preparation to focus on what's called sort of practice-based teacher preparation. If you can go to the next slide. There's a, a, a nationwide movement in teacher preparation to identify sort of what these practices are that teachers need to know and be able to do at the end of their, their preparation or as they evolve as teachers over the course of their career. And they're often referred to as, as identifying core practices or sometimes high leverage practices. Um, and there's a lot of work across the United States right now to say what are these high leverage practices it's also a movement towards um, sort of this, this notion that uh, some people are magically teachers and some people aren't to acknowledging that there are some real and defined and sort of um, research backed skills that, that good teachers have. And we just need to figure out how the best way is to prepare new teachers to have those skills. Um, so what are some of these skills that, that we're integrating into our preparation now in to promote different forms of teaching? Um, well, one of them would be, for example, like how to lead and facilitate a group discussion. So that's a, a skill that a good teacher needs to know and be able to do in order to promote that kind of ability to effectively communicate among their students or the ability to elicit student thinking and facilitate reflective thinking. Or uh, when you're shifting from having the focus be on a teacher just delivering information to a teacher as more of a facilitator of individual levels of, of learning, you need to know how to facilitate a workshop approach where different students or groups of students are, are doing different things at different times. And then here um, at, at UAF, we're also looking um, specifically at what the practices are to prepare teachers across the state and uh, really specifically in rural communities to better understand the communities that they live and work in and make connections between the communities and the knowledges in the communities and the academic curriculum of the school. So we've developed some core practices that we're integrating in our programs here. For example, how do you identify and incorporate local resources to, to incorporate into the classroom? And we were working with all of these different core practices as we prepare teachers um, for tomorrow's school. So if you could move on to the next slide, I'm gonna focus in just for a few minutes here on one specific core practice and what this looks like in our teacher preparation program. And this is in that practice of eliciting student thinking and facilitating reflective thinking in students. So what does it mean to be able to elicit student thinking and facilitate reflective thinking? Well, it means that a teacher can ask good questions and they can ask questions that cause kids to deepen their thinking or explain their thinking and share ideas that are going to benefit their peers. You can integrate this type of facilitative teaching in with almost any academic content. You can integrate it with math, in the sciences, in language arts. So on the next slide, you'll see an example of um, sort of a, a unique way to teach future teachers or sometimes in some cases in-service teachers how to facilitate re uh, reflective thinking among their students through uh, the use of something called thinking routines. And so these come out of um, Harvard's Project Zero, and they're very simple um, sort of uh, question stems that teachers can ask. And again, this can be applied in multiple contexts. You can use it in the sciences, in math, in, in language arts. Uh, in this case, we've been working with the Bering Strait School District for about the last six years on a long-term project. It's called Sustaining Indigenous and Local Knowledge Arts and Teaching. And we've been um, working to develop professional development with that district and with teachers in the district to look at better ways for them to meet the needs of their local communities. 
one of the focuses of that has been looking at local art and local artists and how to doc both document that art and integrate it into the classroom. So in the context of that project, one of the things that we did was we we actually videotaped uh, more than 50 regional artists. And then um, one of the teachers who was working with us on this project from the Bering Strait School District created these visual thinking cards that identify local artists and make have pictures of the art that they made. And then they give these thinking routine stems to teachers, uh, both pre-service and in-service teachers, to help them facilitate questions about the art. And so, for example, with the top one here, it's a very simple set of questions that you ask your students, and you can do this at almost any grade level. And you show them a piece of art and you say, what do you notice? And they answer the question. And then after they answer it, you say, what makes you say that? So two very, very basic, simple questions. But when teachers have an opportunity to practice asking those questions in the right contexts and to take the responses of their students and then build off of them and encourage the students to deepen their thinking, they're learning how to facilitate uh, reflective thinking and elicit student student um, thinking in their in their amongst their classes. So this is just one example of what we're doing to encourage and to teach this type of core practice in our programs. Um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that this type of, of open-ended discussion can help students learn to think creatively, to build off the ideas of their peers, to dig deeper with their thinking, and you need to hit the forward button there so that all these things show up a little bit on the slide there. There we go. Uh, thinking creatively, building off their, their peers' ideas, noticing, respecting, and listening to their peers. And also, these types of thinking routines um, cause kids to have to sort of grapple with uncertainty as they and, and gain empathy as they learn that there can be more than one answer to a question um, and that lots of different perspectives actually can really deepen people's understanding and thinking about something. Um, so this is a thinking routine that you can use uh, when you're doing observations in science or when you're analyzing a piece of literature. Um, it's something that uh, as parents we can try or grandparents when we walk into a museum in the event that museums reopen um, and then look at a piece of art with with our kids and say well what do you notice and what makes you say that. Um, so there's this is just one skill that we're wh that we're developing in our teachers to prepare them for teaching in 21st century schools. So in relation to that very current context, um, I, I want to transition just a little bit to tell you about what's been going on just really very recently in the School of Education in relation to the, the transitions we're having as a, as a society right now, if you could go to the next slide. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about the, the impact on our programs um, and also, you know, looking forward in teacher education, what some of the short-term and long-term impacts might be on both how we teach and how we prepare teachers, because those two things are very closely intertwined. Um, so this spring, uh, as you can imagine, when the schools closed down, that forced uh, all of our interns um, out of their, their classroom placements. And um, as a point of reference, we have uh, students who are completing their final year of preparation to become elementary teachers, to become high school teachers, to become high school and community mental health counselors, special education teachers, um, and, and music education teachers. And we have students in, in all of these contexts. So when everything shut down, there you know, was a little bit of a, whoa, what do we do here? But the, the nice thing for UAF is that almost all of these programs that I just listed um, use an entire year to prepare students for their profession. So we have something called a year-long internship that actually starts on the first day of school and typically goes until the last day of school where this, the intern teachers are put under the tutelage of a mentor teacher and spend that whole year seeing what it's like and preparing for their, their future profession. So it's, it's an apprenticeship for almost a year. Now, the state of Alaska requires that you do 500 hours of, of supervised teaching to get your, your regular license. But because we do these year-long internships, by the time the schools closed down in March, our interns had 750, 800 hours under their belt. So they had already really met and far exceeded the state level requirement for that face-to-face -face time. Additionally, with this year-long internship, we're doing assessments 
throughout the year of their teaching, both their mentor teachers are assessing them and our supervisors from the university are assessing them. So by the time we hit this point, we felt like we really had a solid um, you know, collection of evidence to show that our interns have, have met the, the requirements that they need to become regularly certified teachers. We made a few modifications to our end of the year assessments, but we didn't uh, waive any of them. We, we just made them a little bit different given the context, but we are very um, pleased and proud to know that, that this group of 2020 interns are gonna be able to graduate with a regular certificate, not an emergency license, and they're gonna be ready to go in the fall with whatever, whatever the fall brings them. So that brings me to what we're looking for towards for the future. And I think like everybody, um, you know, we're having to really um, grapple with a lot of uncertainty and uh, do a lot of scenario planning for a lot of different scenarios. We work um, with a lot of districts and we have a, a very uh, close and extremely productive partnership with the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District, but we also have and prepare intern teachers uh, in a bunch of districts across the state. Every year we have interns in the lower Kuskokwim region. We have interns up in the, the, the Nome and Kotzebue regions in the northern regions of Alaska, in rural districts in the interior. Um, and, and now, um, after some issues with accreditation from the, the School of Education down in Anchorage, we have actually taken over offering face-to-face -face teacher preparation in the South Central region also. So we have intern teachers working in Anchorage schools, Matsu schools, Kenai schools. Um, we have a lot of school districts that we're working with, and that makes this um, sort of preparation for the fall uh, even more challenging because we are going to be dependent on what all the individual school districts decide to do as they move forward. So we're really trying to look at um, being flexible in how field work looks, um, hoping that if uh, teachers in different districts go back to teaching through distance methods, that they are able to use our interns um, to, to help them do that. Um, being flexible, if, if it turns out that we have a limited amount of face-to-face -face time uh, in terms of our interns, then we're thinking about ways that we could give them, you know, a temporary certification in conjunction with the Department of Education and then provide support to them in their first year of teaching so that we really feel like by the time they are fully certified, we can assure the quality of those teachers. So finally, in relation to the, the, the global crisis, I think one of the things that's been on the forefront of, of the minds of certainly our students um, and our faculty is what are some core practices that we might need to be incorporating into our teacher preparation programs moving forward. I mean, really starting now, like this summer, um, in relation to making sure that our teachers are who come out of our program are equipped not just to teach face-to-face, -face, but using uh, distance delivery methods. Um, so there's a few that I've identified here on this slide. Uh, that we have sort of risen to the top is things that are going to be really critical that we in integrate in some way into our curriculum, such as um, figuring out what your students have available to them for technology and looking for ways to bridge that digital divide to provide equity in the education, recognizing that some kids are going to have great access to high speed Internet to do everything on Zoom that you ask them to. And in some communities, I was talking to the assistant superintendent up um, in Cotsview, and they have a community in that region where 15% of the kids have access to good internet. And so you have to be able to accommodate this very broad range of, of accessibility and try to provide equity there. Also, this question about balancing synchronous and asynchronous forms of delivery. So for those of you who don't speak that language, synchronous is, is me talking to you in real time, you know, using something like Zoom, whereas an asynchronous route would be giving a kid an assignment and allowing them to finish it on their own time where they don't necessarily have to be engaged at the same time as the teacher. And I think that some schools went to all of one, some school, some school districts went to all of the other. And I think that there's going to be um, some movement towards a combination and recognizing that synchronous is appropriate for some contexts and asynchronous is more necessary in others. Um, I think that also looking to make sure that our future teachers are very fluent in effective distance learning applications. Um, there are tons of them out there. There's things like Zoom and there's things like Flipgrid and there's Google Classrooms and making sure that our teachers are well equipped to use those but also have the developmental knowledge to know when to apply them in what context and with which, which ages. I mean, obviously, um, giving a, a lecture over Zoom is not going to be the most appropriate method to work working with kindergartners. That's not to say that you can't use Zoom in some other formats, but um, you know, knowing that developmental range and how to apply those those tools is going to be really important. 
Um, and then finally, I think that the critical um, need to continue to attend to social and emotional learning, even when you're doing this distance delivery, or maybe even more so, um, I think that we have to remember that as teachers, relationships are the foundation of the work that we do, and that we have to continue to build those relationships, whether it's in face-to-face -face context or through distance types of context. Um, next slide, please. And then lastly, I think regardless of, of the format that we're teaching in, whether it's face-to-face -face or, or distance delivery or some sort of hybrid, we have got to keep at the forefront that uh, need for partnership and collaboration with, with families um, to make sure that uh, we're not only on the same page with them, but like in this current context that we're supporting the families since we're asking them to do a lot of the work here. We need to be able to both equip them and, and be there for the parents as well as, as the kids and make sure everybody's on the same page. So I'm just gonna switch over here in my last couple of minutes to just a couple of um, things that are going on in relation to our work in cultivating, sustaining indigenous educational leaders for Alaska. So this has been an area where UAF has been on the forefront for almost 50 years. We've been um, very, very deliberately uh, looking for the best ways and routes to to um, build our cohorts of, of indigenous teachers for Alaskan schools. And um, we're currently at UAF uh, in sort of midpoint in about a nine year, 10 year grant partnership with some external funding from a philanthropic organization to really try to, uh, to uh, build up those, those strategies and those support systems um, and consolidate them. So we're focusing in sort of on two initiatives that we'll be really um, trying to uh, look to put into to, to sustainable patterns um, after the grant funding wears out. Uh, one is in relation to students and supporting students from high school through to degree completion with Alaska Indigenous Teacher Corps initiatives, including providing um, a, a targeted advising for students to create a timely path to degree completion, um, and introducing them and, and helping them find established campus support services building cohorts among folks, whether it's students who are here on our Fairbanks campus or who are down in Anchorage or, or who are completing their whole education through distance delivery um, across Alaska. How do we build community uh, and support among those students to encourage retention and degree completion? And also making sure that we provide a teacher preparation built to support and sustain indigenous and local knowledge. And then the other piece that we're looking at is, and we're, I'm really excited about, is building alliances that are focused on um, creating um, partnerships that recruit and support Alaska Native teachers who are pursuing an Alaska Native, uh, a UAF teaching degree, excuse me. Um, and so really trying to look and recognize that there are a lot of people out there who are in a very strong level of consensus that having more uh, local teachers for local schools is really critical to Alaska. And also there seem to be often resources out there, but getting it all to work together so that we are really moving the needle on increasing the number of local and indigenous teachers who are prepared for Alaska schools is, is something that continues to be a, a big challenge, um, even though we've been working on it for 50 years. And so we're really looking to try to um, work across organizations and collaborate between the university and the community campuses and profit organizations, nonprofit organizations and local school districts to build these coalitions where we can work together towards shared goals um, to really try to increase the, the rate at which we're, um, we're graduating Alaska Native teachers for, for Alaska schools. Uh, next slide, please. So those are our, our big things that we got going on. One other thing I'll just mention is that um, with the same philanthropic organization that's been funding our efforts with the Bering Strait School District, we have another grant to build right now an Alaska Future Teacher Space um, that's going out to bid this week. Very excited. We're going to be um, uh, educators and teacher education has a the tendency to sort of often be put in those ATCO units kind of in the on the far corner of the campus. We're not, we're in the greening building, but it's not necessarily the nicest or newest space. So we're excited to be renovating and putting in a beautiful new classroom and student collaboration space, faculty collaboration space um, with the goal of, of creating a, a place to for folks to learn how to teach tomorrow's teachers um, in a space designed for today's learners. So we're very excited about that and that should um, be coming fully online by almost by Christmas this year. We're going to be working starting this summer. So the last slide there is just a quick um, overview. One more forward, please. 
a uh, quick overview of the programs that we offer at UAF and where we offer them. Um, we offer fully accredited licensure and degree programs in elementary and secondary, uh, in special education, in counseling. Uh, there are early childhood programs that are offered through the community and technical college here in Fairbanks. And then uh, a variety of our programs offer a master's degree also. Um, most of those, all of those programs are available through distance. Um, and nearly all of them are available face-to-face, -face, um, both in Fairbanks and down in Anchorage with the faculty that we have working down there. So um, I hope that I've shared some information with you that maybe you didn't know, and I look forward to your questions and, and really um, genuinely appreciate the opportunity to speak with you here today. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Amy. I certainly appreciate um, you sharing what we might call reactive lessons learned um, and, and that you're promoting now proactive preparation for the fall um, as far as what's known and unknown at this point. So uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Janelle to moderate the questions that have come in during your presentation. Thanks so much, Amy. All right, um, so we don't have very many questions yet. I will just encourage anyone who's seeing this live to go ahead and type those into the chat on YouTube. Uh, one comment that did come in was just thank you for the dedication of the staff there to producing well-prepared educators. I think that came from Fairbanks Education Association, a little appreciation for uh, those who are training their members. Um, one question that did come in was, what are the social and emotional learning techniques and trauma-informed education methods that are being taught to education students? That's a great question. And um, I can say, so one of the things that we do um, as, a, as an entire school of education, and it's part of our accreditation requirements, is um, we engage in a continuous improvement sort of model. And that means that we meet uh, about every, oh, three or so months, and we look at data sets that we get from the employers of our graduates, from the um, graduates themselves, from students who are at the end of their, their program, as well as we do case studies of our graduates. And this, this um, notion of in integrating uh, trauma-informed teaching practices is definitely something that we have found in that data review and that th we've been looking for the best ways to integrate those that knowledge across our programs. I think it's going to be different whether you're talking about an, an elementary or a secondary or a special education licensure program, but it's definitely there are resources and they're being integrated um, in various places uh, uh, throughout the curriculum. I think that primarily it's falling in the, the, the purview of our classroom management collaboration and communication sort of courses. Um, there are a wealth of resources on the internet right now that those instructors are drawing from um, to inform what they pull in about trauma-informed practice. But I think a lot of it is really tied to the strategies that we give teachers for relationship building and for communication with their students and with families. And that's been something that's always been integrated in our program, but just re sort of refocusing it. Um, and then also the, the impact that um, uh, sort of looking at more ways to deal with extreme behaviors in the classroom um, and how students can learn to manage that and what some different approaches are with that and, and really promoting that um, sort of community approach to education that it, it, it takes a village and we need to know how to work across our organizations. Okay, thanks. Um, another question might be just, uh, we know that the university has had to move a lot of things online. I mean, UAF in particular has already a structure in place to offer many classes online, which is great, but has that created any specific challenges for your department or any new opportunities potentially? Um, so thanks for the question. The, we were really well positioned within the School of Education for a transition to entirely distance delivery. Um, 
actually the UAS School of Education has been offering some form of a distance delivered degree program in education since 1970, if you can believe that. I've actually seen videotapes, they're about this big, that would get put in, in envelopes and sent out to communities to facilitate that, you know, lectures that were, were taped on them. But so we've been doing distance education for a very, very long time and evolving our skills in this area. So when the meeting came and I had to tell everybody, hey, if you're doing a face-to-face -face class, it's got to get switched over to distance delivery. We had exactly one person who hadn't done that before. And so it was really a pretty smooth transition for us. Um, nearly all of our courses have been offered through distance. Really, the, the big um, set of confusion and questions came around the fieldwork piece and what that was going to look like. And once the schools shut down, that sort of answered that question for us. It wasn't something where we had to um, really make a lot of negotiations. And then we just had to work with the Department of Education um, to make sure that we were in agreement about what our, our students would need to do in order to finish off their year. But really in um, education, it's been a pretty pretty smooth transition. I think we have a, um, a I don't know what the split is. I'd say it's maybe a 60-40 split between coursework that's offered synchronously where I'm talking to you and meeting with you, you know, several times a week uh, versus ones that are asynchronous. Um, we have a lot of courses actually that are uh, entirely on asynchronous. You can do our entire special education program with an asynchronous online program that's been certified um, by Quality Matters, as, as um, which is the highest level of, of um, insur assurance of quality online education that's offered in the United States. Very cool. Well, there's, and there's a couple of people online expressing how impressed they are by uh, how long you've been doing that. And that actually is all the questions that have come in. Great. Well, thank you again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. OK, great. Thank you, Amy. Um, well, for those of you who would have normally joined us at our regular luncheon and purchased 50-50 tickets, I would suggest that you take that money and spend it on Takeout Tuesday by ordering dinner from a local restaurant tonight, or maybe donate it to a nonprofit locally that's providing critical service during these challenging times. We so appreciate your continued participation and support uh, during these uh, uncertain, uh, challenging presentation times. Um, and we really look forward to next week because at long last, we will hear from the Colonel Benjamin Bishop uh, on the state of Eielson Air Force Base. And I'm sure many of you tuned in last week to the arrival of the first two F-35s, which was very exciting for our community. Um, in a way, it will be his farewell address as he prepares to leave our greater Fairbanks community. And so we hope that you'll all attend and be able to wish him well along his journey. Uh, again, stay tuned to our website and our twice weekly newsletter, The Scoop, for information on our luncheons, advocacy, and upcoming event updates. Thanks so much, Fairbanks. Be well.